Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton clash. Hillary has experience, but it's bad experience. You've got to ask yourself, why won't he release his tax returns? The candidates come out swinging in their first presidential debate. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly, we'll take you here to the spin zone, reacting to the first presidential debate between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. What did these people think coming up? Protecting the homeland. Congress questions top security leaders about threats to Americans. And Christians feeling forgotten. Ed Penton describes the challenges facing Christian refugees in Iraq. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, September 27th, 2016. We had a great, great time last night. It was a fascinating period of time, and I think we did very well. Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton reflect on their first debate. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. We have debate reaction from Jason Calvey on location in a moment. First, Lauren Ashburn reports from our political desk. Lauren? Brian, both are claiming victory today in what seems to be the most watched presidential debate in television history. The Nielsen Company says 81.4 million people tuned in to 11 networks, beating the 80.6 million records set by the Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan TV presidential debate in 1980. But it did fall short of the predicted 100 million viewers. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump pulled no punches during their first debate. They clashed over everything from trade to birtherism, from debate prep to policy. I have a feeling that by the end of this evening, I'm going to be blamed for everything that's ever happened. Why not? Why not? Yeah. Trump slammed her on emails. That was more than a mistake. That was done purposely. OK, that was not a mistake. That was done purposely. And they bickered over his tax returns. He didn't pay any federal income tax. So that makes if me he's smart. Paid Trump portrayed Clinton as a Washington insider. Hillary has experience. But it's bad experience. While Clinton cited her experience to counter Trump's suggestion that she has no endurance. As soon as he travels to 112 countries and negotiates a peace deal, a ceasefire, or even spends 11 hours testifying in front of uh, a congressional committee, he can talk to me about stamina. Presidential nominees don't usually come to the spin room to talk to reporters after a one-on-one -on -one debate, but Donald Trump did to Jason Calvey. Plus, he talked to a star-studded cast of surrogates for both candidates. I have a winning temperament. Testing that temperament after the debate, Donald Trump takes a spin around the spin room. I thought it went great. Yeah, I thought it was, I thought Lester did a very good job. Supporters of both nominees claim debate victories. Donald Trump won the debate, hands down, but more importantly, she Sorry. proved she couldn't be president of the United States. It was fun seeing Donald so flustered, right? You know, she would she would deal with facts and, and actually answer the questions, and Donald kept on trying to deflect. I thought Dick dug the hole way deeper on uh, birtherism, which he, he said he anticipated and couldn't get out of, uh, and on his failure to release his tax returns. The limits of a 90-minute debate, some questions just weren't asked nothing on pro-life issues. These issues are very important to Americans. And the fact that lots of Americans don't know because Hillary will never admit, the fact is she's for abortion anyone, anytime, anywhere. There are no restrictions, no late term, no sex selection, no um, fetal pain, none of that. That's something that is important to the American people and I think you're going to hear it uh, as we move forward a little bit later with other debates. And no questions on immigration. It wasn't asked by the uh, moderator, which I guess is a failure uh, for sh sure. Uh, and Donald Why a Trump, failure? Well, I mean, it's a major issue in this election. American people are concerned about it. So where did each campaign think they did best? I think that uh, uh, she was just nailed it on the economy on, uh, on bi and the values that go into building the economy. I think talking about trade, maybe, because uh, she's so bad on trade, we're losing our jobs, we're losing everything. The first of three presidential debates is history. Up next, the one and only vice presidential debate next week. Jason Calvey, EWTN Newsnight.
reaction continues to pour in today on this National Voter Registration Day. And while national polls won't be available for a few days, today both candidates' supporters continue to praise the person they call the winner. And that includes Speaker of the House Paul Ryan. I saw Hillary Clinton give a polished, well-rehearsed defense of the status quo, which seven out of ten Americans don't like. Uh, I saw Donald Trump give a spirited voice uh, to those of us who don't like the status quo. Genevieve Wood is former RNC spokesperson. Jeannie Mancini is president of the March for Life. Now, as Jason, welcome to the program. Thanks Thank for having you. Us. As Jason mentioned just a few minutes ago, pro-life issues were not talked about at all. Why not? And do you wish they were? We absolutely do, and voters do as well. Apparently, abortion was the second most researched uh, term on the internet last night after immigration. And so um, for your voters and viewers who are wondering where they stand on this issue, they can check out March for Life Action because we have a scorecard that shows where both candidates stand on this issue. And it's very clear that one is pro-life and one is not. Jeannie, give, uh, I'm sorry, Genevieve, give me your perspective mm -hmm. on whether or not you think this issue will be talked about in the next few debates based on past presidential debates you know about? Well, I think it eventually always comes up, either as a standalone issue or because, and I can't imagine we're not going to have a discussion on judges and who goes on the Supreme Court and what their philosophy is about that. And that's an obvious place to bring it up. And look, I mean, Hillary Clinton's not scared of her position on this, but I don't think Donald Trump is scared of his either. So I think it's a place where you're going to see a real difference of opinion and you're going to have a lot of folks out there who can understand this is the kind of judges he's going to pick versus what she's going to pick and what that means for the life issue. If you were moderator, Jeannie, of the next debate, what is the abortion question you would ask? I would want to ask Hillary Clinton if she really knows how out of touch she is with mainstream America, much less uh, pro-life Catholics who know that life begins at conception. Her stance is pro-abortion until the time of birth paid for by your taxpayer dollars. That is radically out of touch with mainstream America. And you had put together an ad campaign that was on all of the television networks that uh, talked about abortion and, and, and the issues and how they are in mainstream America. Absolutely. It's, it's the consensus. It's that eight out of 10 Americans are in favor of strong, robust restrictions on abortion. That's not what Hillary Clinton is standing for in the least. Genevieve, historically, where would you say the Republican and the Democratic Party are on the abortion issue? Well, I mean, historically, and I think it just continues to play out, Democrats have been increasingly the party that believes abortion on demand at any moment, at any time, for any reason. Uh, Republicans are the only ones who, they aren't all perfect, but right. they, in most cases, want to at least put some serious brakes on it. They certainly don't think tax dollars ought to be supporting it. I mean, there is a real difference here. You can talk about trade and a lot of issues, but this is one area where there is a very clear difference between what the Republican candidate stands for and what the Democratic candidate stands for. Both of you, a, a, a Wall Street Journal editorial board member called Clinton the empress of the status quo. <laughs> um, when it comes to social issues, do you, Genevieve, think that is true? Is it the status quo? Is it true for this administration on social issues? Yeah, it depends on what status quo you're talking about. Certainly the status quo of the abortion movement. It's the status quo of the Obama administration. It's the status quo of the Democratic Party. But I do not think that the majority of Americans, and I think the ad that you guys did was terrific in pointing this out, the vast majority of Americans, they may not all be opposed to abortion all the time, but the vast majority thinks it should be restricted well beyond what Hillary Clinton wants to do. But I guess my question, Jeannie, is isn't, hasn't it become worse under this administration? I would say yes. I think uh, President Obama has been the most pro-abortion president in the history since Roe versus Wade was decided. And I think what we'll see with Hillary Clinton is more of that. I mean, she has absolutely promised to do away with the Hyde Amendment, which until recently was a bipartisan supported a uh, popular bill which prohibits taxpayer funding of abortion, and Americans are strongly in favor of that. So, but she's absolutely promising to do away with it. So, I think she'll push us further um, from where we've even gotten with President Obama, unfortunately. Hey, Jeannie Mancini, March for Life. Genevieve Wood, former RNC spokesperson. Thank, Thank you so you. much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Brian, the vice presidential debate is on Tuesday in Farmville, Virginia, and Republican vice presidential nominee Mike Pence will square off against his Democratic counterpart, Tim. Kane. We will be there. We will join you those days with pre and post debate reporting and analysis from a Catholic perspective. Brian. Thank you, Lauren Ashburn.
And other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. The FBI director worries violent militants will soon spill out of the Middle East to carry out more attacks around the world. Wyatt Goolsby is at Capitol Hill, where Homeland Security leaders testified today. Wyatt? Brian, FBI Director James Comey says the number of Americans traveling to Syria to fight alongside ISIS is way down. But Comey is also predicting that as ISIS loses territory in the region, terrorists will stream out of it. They will not all die on the battlefield in Syria and Iraq. There will be a terrorist diaspora sometime in the next two to five years like we've never seen before. FBI Director James Comey laying out all the potential risks to the United States from ISIS. Comey joined Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson and National Counterterrorism Director Nicholas Rasmussen. Rasmussen says the array of terrorists around the world is broader, wider, and deeper than ever. Recent attacks in Minnesota and New York and New Jersey underscore that the ongoing threat we face from individuals who is, is from individuals who choose relatively simple attack methods. Jay Johnson says the good news is that agencies like the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security are working together better than ever before. But he says lone wolf attacks inspired by ISIS are on the rise. Democrats like Senator Claire McCaskill say the next step is keeping them from buying assault weapons. If you are on a terrorist watch list and are not allowed to fly on an airplane, then you shouldn't be allowed to buy a gun. But Republicans like Senator Ron Johnson disagree, saying terrorists will use knives, bombs, even trucks to carry out attacks. Is it perfect? No. And I mentioned that, so the Director Coleman mentioned that as well. But is it better? You bet it is. And we're a safer country as a result. Republicans questioned Comey again about Hillary Clinton's private email server, but he is defending his recommendation not to prosecute Clinton. Brian. Wyatt Goolsby at the Capitol. Thank you, Wyatt. A Catholic charity reaches out to persecuted and displaced Christians in Iraq. Aid to the Church in Need invited our news partner, the National Catholic Register, to take a first-hand look at their plight. Ed Penton, Rome correspondent for EWTN's National Catholic Register, recently returned from Iraq, joining us now from Rome. Ed, you visited Christian refugees who fled Mosul and Christian villages after ISIS invaded there in the summer of 2014. What is the situation like for them right now? Uh, it's still pretty desperate, really. There are a lot of, a lot of refugees still. Uh, there were 100,000 uh, were displaced, and there's still 100,000 now. Um, and they're in various refugee camps uh, around the north of the country. Um, and so they're, they're getting quite desperate. They've been there two years now, and they're looking now to go back to their homes as soon as they can. Do they have hope for their future, and what can we do to help them? They do have a lot of hope. A lot of them, though, are, are kind of giving up hope as well because they, they feel that uh, their future is outside Iraq. They want to go abroad. They think Iraq is too, too dangerous. There's, there's not enough peace and there's been too much conflict over the past uh, 15 or so years. And so they, they really have had enough. But there are others that uh, do want to go back and they, they do have a lot of hope. And uh, I think. Uh, a lot of uh, what can be done from, uh, from the West point, and they feel kind of abandoned by the West. Uh, they feel that uh, they haven't done enough, and I think um, what we can do back in the West is to write to our politicians, uh, write to congressmen, and help the aid agencies to provide uh, humanitarian aid for them. Ed, I'm really curious about their view of Islam and their Muslim neighbors. Yes, uh, it's mixed, but uh, I mean, a lot of them have good relationships with their Muslim neighbors, but at the same time, a lot of them feel betrayed by them. Uh, a lot of their Muslim neighbors actually joined ISIS, and so when they go back to their homes, uh, they're not going to be able to trust them. There's a big problem of trust there. And also, a lot of them, or some of them we spoke to rather, uh, feel that Islam actually is to blame, and they feel that ISIS, even some of them believe that ISIS is the true Islam. So there's a lot of disenchantment uh, with Islam and they feel that uh, it's, it, that is really the root of the problem. Um, but at the same time they also consider the United States to be, uh, to have got them into this mess and they look to the United States to get them out of it. Well we thank you for your first hand uh, report on the situation in Iraq for Christians. Ed Penton with EWTN's National Catholic Register. Thank you Ed. Thanks Brian. Coming up, new details of this weekend's planned papal visit to Georgia and Azerbaijan. And looming threats, including the death penalty, face some Christians.
Today, September 27th, is the Memorial St. Vincent de Paul. As a scholarly young priest, he was captured by pirates and sold as a slave in Africa. Later, he helped reinvigorate the Catholic Church in the 17th century, showing great love for the poor. Thank you for joining us this Tuesday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. Pope Francis leaves the Vatican on Friday morning for a weekend visit to the Republic of Georgia and Azerbaijan. This trip, his 16th pastoral visit outside Italy, follows his visit to neighboring Armenia last June. The Holy See Press Office says Francis will be greeted by Georgia's president and other civic leaders. He'll then meet with that country's Orthodox patriarch. Ahead of next week's Rosh Hashanah holiday, Pope Francis wishes the Jewish people a sweet new year. He spoke Monday to leaders of the World Jewish Congress. They say the Pope is concerned Europe is closing itself up and often forgets that it has been enriched by migrants. Pope Francis told them Europe needs to do better integrating refugees. An international court convicts a Muslim extremist of destroying nine religious sites in the African nation of Mali. Ahmad al-Faqi al-Mahdi admits overseeing the destruction of nine mausoleums and a mosque door in Timbuktu. He is sentenced now to nine years in prison for the war crimes. This is a landmark case for the International Criminal Court established in 2002. An Episcopalian bishop in Sudan calls for the release of four people, including two Christian pastors. The bishop, who believes that they have been unlawfully detained, says they're facing fabricated charges, some punishable by death. Christina Ariaga is a commissioner for USERF, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Why are these men being held? Well, supposedly they're being held because uh, they were engaged in espionage. We know for a fact that's not true. Since 2011, the Sudanese government has been harassing members of these evangelical churches. And I want to say their names because I think it's really important to say uh, to name names. Is Reverend Tauro, uh, Reverend Khoury, and uh, Abdul Mada, and also a Czech national by the name of Mr. Jacek. So these are four real people who are in real danger. How does the Sudanese government defend this? Uh, they're saying that they're advocating for their rights, but it's a very confused situation, and it's a symptom of a much larger problem. The Constitution in Sudan guarantees religious liberty, but the National Assembly, which is the equivalent of Congress, last year in 2015, uh, passed laws saying that anyone who converted could be sentenced to death. So you have designated, your group designating this a CPC, a country of particular concern. What does that mean, really? Uh, what it means is the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom makes this recommendation to Congress, the President, and also to the State Department, so that the State Department can opt to limit its trade agreements with the government of Sudan and demand that they respect religious liberty, as they say in their Constitution and according to international human rights covenants. What is life like for Christians in Sudan? It's pretty terrible. Uh, Christians are a minority of the country, and the National Assembly has passed these really vague laws associated with so-called indecency. Uh, anyone who criticizes or is perceived as criticizing the Prophet Muhammad can be sentenced to flogging, and this happens every single year. How does Sudan con compare, I guess, with other nations in this area of concern? Well, as a Cuban American, I always like to say that Cuba is the worst violator of religious liberty. Uh, however, what we have seen in the Sudan is truly the worst of the worst. Worse than Cuba. Worse than Cuba. Coming from you, that's a big deal. <laughs> what action do you believe that our government should take? Well, the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom puts out this report every year making recommendations uh, of things that should be done uh, in different countries. In Sudan, we're asking for the government to start a commission for the rights of non-Muslims. And we're also hoping that members of Congress will call for the release of these four evangelicals whose only crime has been to preach the word of God to their fellow Sudanese. Not a terrible crime, of course, in God's eyes. Christina Ariaga, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. We appreciate you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Up next, end-of-life issues, the Catholic response to assisted suicide in Canada. And the Pope offers a prayerful solution to overcoming spiritual darkness. Pope Francis focuses his morning homily on dark moments of spiritual desolation we all experience. He says silence and prayer is the way to overcome the darkness, not pills or alcohol. 
Thanks for joining us this Tuesday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. Pro-life advocates join lawmakers on Capitol Hill pushing for the Born Alive bill. It would protect the lives of infants who survive attempts to abort them. We focus on the mother and the baby rather than people carrying signs or, or Planned Parenthood saying all the good things that they ostensibly do besides killing children. Then hearts and minds change because we begin to humanize the victim, begin to recognize the humanity of the victim and the inhumanity of what's being done to them. Representative Trent Fank says the Born Alive bill will pass easily if it gets a fair vote. He says 90 percent of Americans support it. He wants people to urge their senators to hold that vote. Pro-lifers release a video campaign opposing Washington, D.C.'s so-called Death with Dignity Act. It would allow doctors to prescribe lethal drugs to patients wanting to commit suicide. Doctors and nurses agree that most patients outlive their prognosis by months if not years. Lawmakers should ensure that patients have the best health care possible, not bully them into thinking that their only choice is to take their own life. The No DC Suicide Group says the euthanasia initiative is seriously flawed, unnecessary, and puts patients' lives at risk. The ordinance is now before the DC City Council. Catholic bishops issue a response to Canada's new euthanasia law with guidelines for clergy administering the sacraments. Alex Shaddenberg, the international chair of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, joining us from Ontario, Canada by Skype. Alex, what sort of guidance are the priests getting there from the bishops in Alberta and the Northwest Territories? Well, actually, quite a few of the bishops through the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops have been urging there to be, uh, how would you say, uh, support to oppose euthanasia and assisted suicide. But the big issue right now has also become conscience rights for physicians, because right now the physicians are being pressured that if they want nothing to do with euthanasia and assisted suicide, that they're going to have to refer, which of course would mean that they're complicit in the act, or they're going to just simply have to leave. And this has been a, a great problem, and that physicians are trying to work together to, to negotiate an answer that makes it so that they do not have to be involved with killing their patients. And that's been a big issue right now. And Catholic teaching, of course, is very clear on this issue, is it not? There's no question about Catholic teaching. We do not in any way... Uh, act or be complicit in an act of killing another person. Euthanasia is when a doctor, in this case a doctor, would lethally inject their patient, which is obviously a, an act of causing death directly. It's, uh, it's not unintentional, whereas assisted suicide is to provide the lethal dose for the person that causes their own death. In both cases, the doctor is completely complicit in the act, and the Catholic Church is very clear that we do not participate in these things. We're to care for people, not kill them. So we balance the desire for compassion and comfort with the dignity of life then? Well, doctors do not need euthanasia or assisted suicide. This, this whole argument that people are suffering is an important argument, but the fact of it is, is that doctors are capable of properly caring for their patients without ever having to kill them or be involved with their suicide. It's just simply not necessary. But on top of it, you get this whole pressure. They say, now that it's legal, you have to be complicit in the act. But you see... I don't want a doctor to be complicit in the act. So since uh, euthanasia was legalized a year ago, have you seen the number increase? Well, there's been uh, quite a few, but we don't actually know what the number is. There was a, uh, a report came out saying uh, about a month ago that there have been about 160 deaths, but quite a few of the hospitals were saying that they're not reporting it. Thanks for keeping us up to date from Canada. Alex Shaddenberg, Euthanasia Prevention Coalition. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the Diocese of Lubbock, Texas gets a new shepherd. Pope Francis picks Monsignor Robert Corbert to succeed Bishop Placido Rodriguez. He has been serving as a parish priest at St. Rita in Dallas. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good night. God bless.